and everybody of note came to stay here. You name them, Henry James, Arthur Blomfield, Edwin Abbey, and then, of course, the war came, and um, it rather ceased, and the car came too. We should never be an isolated country village again with all its advantages and its disadvantages, I suppose. And those are really, they, we have no great families, really, living in Broadway now. We're all of a middling class. Dr. Hutton, you sound like a man almost possessed by the town in which you've lived for so many years. It's almost as though it's become an obsession with you to, to tell its history as well. Would you say I was right? Well, I don't think there's ever been a history of Broadway written. Uh, one would like to do it, but uh, it's, it it's very difficult. We haven't, um, we, no great battles have been fought here, except for Sir Thomas and the Sheldons and Savage. I suppose no great people have lived here. Over its thousand years of history, it's gone quietly on, except for the traffic, the coaches and that sort of thing, the, the horse-drawn coaches, I mean, not the coaches now which besiege us. But it's a fascinating thing to know uh, a great deal about a little bit. You can be a specialist, you see. I was just an ordinary general practitioner, a country doctor. I don't think anybody would call you ordinary, Dr. Houghton, but it's been a pleasure listening to you. Thank you for giving me your time. Oh, well, thank you very much. Well, I doubt that anybody could tell me more about Broadway than Dr. Houghton, but there is somebody I'm going to meet any second now who could tell me about another aspect of Broadway, or at least the area surrounding Broadway. I'm going to meet him down here in, in a public house. Needless to say, he's a lovely character. He's called Frank Clark, but everybody here knows him as Gable. Clark Gable. Frank, I reckon you've sat here many a score of times throughout your life. Oh, Clark, I sat out here years ago when that used to be all horses and carriages with the trees on. When they pulled the timber out the wood with big horses. I had my push point in here. My grandfather, when I was five, what was the point then? You were drinking when you were five? Yes, in here with my grandfather. And he had a straight quart and I had a point. That before they had to be 18 in the pub, sat on his lap in there, on his knee rather on the same settle what's still in the pub. What, what did your family do? My family, my father used to be, my grandfather was a postman, used to walk this snow hill to Ford twice a day. Then my father took it over. I had to go then before I went to school up them feeding cattle. For John Bird Ebersham, the butchers, then, when I got a little holder, he says to me, you'll have to start earning your own living. He said, you'll have to get some ferrets and a dog, and then you'll have to go a poaching. So that when I started poaching, then I had to go with that. The next job I had, I went to work for Lady Maud Bowes Lyon, what was aunt to the Queen of England, lived top of Broadway at six shillings a week. What did you do for her, Frank? Well, I was second gardener for Lady Maud Bowes Lion. Then, eventually, I got tired of that, and I went on working round here for a man called Mr King, the coal man. I had an old Chevrolet lorry with a wooden chassis what used to take hounds round there with Master Bill Scott, who was, was master of the fox hounds and years ago. And you, you're still associated with the Foxhounds, are you? Oh yes, I'm still. I, I've been, I've been with the Foxhounds around here in North Cotswold. Started with them with my grandfather, Mr. Till Clark, lured me out to stop those up. And terriers used to take them round here years ago, not with motors, but walk with them, then stop out all night till they come in the morning. 
His brother Fanshaw's mother was married now to Lord Dobbin at Batsford Park. She hunted down ten years ago. And what is, what is what was what, how would you describe uh, earth stopping? Well, earth stopping is you go at night, you go at night, and you you go round at night with a graft, what you call not a spade, a graft. Then you go at night when the foxes are out at night feeding or stealing chickens. You walk round and you fill the holes in and you check them up early in the morning for the hounds are going to start and in case the badgers have scratched because sometimes the badgers will open the fox holes you see and then you do that at night to keep the foxes out so as when the hounds are running them they can't get back in well eventually then when I was a poaching, you see. I used to work for Captain Bomford down there. As a poacher? Now, well, I, <laughs> I worked as him as on his farm to keep the vermin down. Yeah. Yeah, and eventually the police stopped me one night. I walking down out the field, the bottom. Yeah, and he says to me, oh, your pocket's bulging. I said, well, what's the matter with that? Then he says to me, he says, do you think I could put my hand in your pocket and see what you got in there? I said, certainly. So idiot put his hand in, and in my pocket was my ferret. <laughs> yeah. And my ferret bit the copper through the thumb. Then the copper says to me, he says, how do I get the ferret off? And I said, the same bloody way is what you got him under. I <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I marched him along the road about half a mile. With a, with a, with a ferret stuck on the end of his stomach. On his thumb to Mr. Bumper. That's as true this is, it's quite true. It's printed in the book at Broadway, so don't worry, the village remembered. Then I walked him along to Mr. Bumper's house and he said, what's the matter, Frank? I said, I've got a problem. I said, I've got a policeman, I said, with a ferret on his thumb. <laughs> And he says to me, he says, well, how did he get him on? I said, well, he bit him, I says, because he said he had put his hand in my pocket to see what was in there, I says. And he said, he ought to have more sense, he said, a man of your character, he says. He said, because you've had permission on my ground, he says, for yours. <laughs> it's been a treat talking to you, Frank. You're a very good health. Yeah, good health. Well, I think you'll agree that with Frank there, you've just met the essence of old Broadway, and now I'm going to make my way right up through the main street, and I'll be surrounded by what is the new Broadway, the tourists. And because of that, I'm going to call in the Ligon Arms. I think some idea now what Broadway is all about. Very handsome it is too. Now we're going to make our way round here, this little lane, and it won't be a couple of seconds before we're back into countryside again and on our way towards the Broadway Tower. It's better right into the teeth of the wind. It's all right, I like visiting the towns and talking about them, seeing them, but this is the essence of the walk. Get out into the countryside again. Head up now, climb up all the way to Broadway, really. Up to the tower. Miserable morning, grey, not at all the kind of day to be here. But you have to come here and past the Broadway Tower. It was built in 1798 at the whim and fancy of the Countess of Coventry, wife of the sixth Earl. Nobody quite knows why she wanted it put there. The architect was James Wyatt, the same architect who built Doddington Hall, which you pass either on your way from Bath to here or going back the Cotswold Way the other way. 
Uh, you can see it's just three rounded turrets canted in at the base, and it stands 55 feet high. They say that from the top, you can see over 12 counties on a good day, which this most certainly is not. But I can't really see why you can't see 12 counties from the top of the hill anyway, because you've got a marvelous view. Uh, Sir Thomas Phillips owned it for a short time. He kept his collection of rare antiquarian manuscripts in it, and he also kept his own private printing press. And then after that, William Morris used to come here, and with him, most of the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. They did a lot of work here. And if you go up onto the third floor there, and I think you ought to, there's an exhibition of the work of William Morris and a short history of his life, which is well worth going to see. had your fill you go through that gate head off towards fish hill past the quarry and on there we are and it's getting muddier by the second head towards the fish inn And really, once you leave Broadway and Broadway Tower, you've finished climbing. So on the last lap, so to speak, you've got to come round here. You're going to cross the A44 in a minute, but just up there on the right is the Fish Inn. It was built as a summer house for Sir John Cotterell of Frankham House. And it's a strange building. Nobody knows why it's called the Fish Inn at all. Don't, don't go around there. Come up here and have a look at that. Ah, the beautiful piece of slate carving there at the top of the graph, because it's really worth stopping at. Beautifully carved, even tell you how far it is to New York if you should want to know the route. And then come on down the steps. And over the stile, and there, as you go over the stile, where those woods are in the valley down there, on there, that is Chipping Camden. That's where we're going now. Mm -hmm. 